Oh, yes, let's continue. Um, I was, you know, just uh, going through uh, the notes uh, which have been provided on this uh, subject. And I was just kind of, you know, thinking, uh, why did Pastor include these chapters? And uh, what did he hope to accomplish, you know, uh, by writing down all of these things? And I just kind of, uh, you know, realized that this section on repentance, I think uh, he basically put in these things to kind of move us on towards action. It's all very nice, you know, talking about holiness and understanding the need for holiness uh, and the importance of it and all of that. Uh, but no point in just thinking about it. It's time to also act. Uh, it's also time to, you know, um, uh, to step up where uh, you say, OK, fine, I'm actually going to get down and, you know, do whatever is needed uh, to uh, to make this happen. So um, we are just going to have two sessions on this section. But the whole idea behind these, you know, today's session and uh, the next session is basically to understand that it's all about action. Uh, it's not enough to just simply, you know, long for holiness and pray for holiness. But um, we also need to be acting. Uh, we should be, you know, um, actively identifying all those areas where uh, correction is needed, where growth is needed, and uh, uh, start putting those things into practice. So you know, we'll now just kind of look at a few um, passages uh, which talk about this. So you know, um, if you've noticed, this is not really about imparting any new information or new revelations. It's more, you know, the, these uh, this session and next week's session is more about reminding ourselves about what God expects of us. Okay, so once we have understood what God expects of us, you know, because those these are the things which you know which Jesus very openly writes to the churches. He's not writing to unbelievers. He writes to the churches and he says, you know, I need you need you to sharpen up in these areas. You're getting slack and it won't do. So uh, God uh, is very serious about actual action. OK, so let's actually look at some scriptures which talk about that. Um, we are familiar with them. But um, hopefully, even as we go through these scriptures once more, uh, it will kind of you know stir up in us uh, a resolve, a determination to actually act upon what God is telling us to do. So uh, Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 10, if someone could read out, please. Matthew 3, 7 to 10. Matthew chapter 3, verses 7 to 10. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees coming to where he was baptizing, he said to them, You brood of vipers who warned you to flee from the coming wrath, produce fruit in keeping with the repentance. And do not think you can say to yourself, We have Abraham as our father. I tell you that out of these stones, God can raise up children for Abraham. The axe is already at the root of the trees, and every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. All right. So the, we here we have John the Baptist speaking, and when the Pharisees and Sadducees come over there, you know, to the river to undergo this uh, ritual of baptism, he says to them, "This ritual doesn't apply to you. Why? Because you are not producing fruit, um, which demonstrates that you are repentant." So if you were if you were producing you know fruit in your lives, if your actions, if your words, if your thoughts were uh, were something which reflect repentance, then yes, you know this baptism uh, ceremony would have uh, applied to you. But then the way the way you are living your lifestyle, it shows that you are not doing anything that shows uh, repentance. So for such people. Uh, he says there is already the axe is already at the root of the tree. OK, so um, he says it is not enough to have a, um, a godly lineage just because you are descendants of Abraham. That's not enough. Uh, what are you in your heart right now? What are your actions right now? That also counts. So in the same way, 
it's not enough for us believers to say now god is our father you know he is our abba father yes it is good it's good uh, that we have been accepted into the uh, into the lord's family and it is good that uh, god is now our heavenly father but uh, what about your actions are you living like as if you belong to god are you living like a child of god uh, or not because you know finally it comes down to um, action now i am not saying that salvation is based on works because salvation is a free gift that god gives to helpless people who can never change themselves on their own so it's a free gift that is given to us we don't earn salvation in any way but once we are saved we are saved for a purpose why did jesus save us why uh, and why did god uh, you know redeem us it it is so that we would be made into the likeness of jesus christ the whole point of salvation being offered to us is so that we can become into the likeness of jesus christ and if we sit back and say oh i just came here for the ticket to heaven i have I'm, i have no interest in you know becoming like jesus christ then it says over here the axe is already laid at the root of the tree so this is something we need to watch out why was salvation offered to us what is the purpose of redemption why were our sins wiped out not just our past sins even the future sins which we are going to commit all of them already forgiven and we are completely clothed in the righteousness of Christ why was all this done for us there's a purpose so that we can be a holy people unto him so that we can become like Jesus Christ and if you say i don't want that and you're you know you're, you're um, um canceling out the very purpose for which salvation was given then all that you know awaits us is the axe which is already laid uh, to the, to the root of the tree okay so it says in matthew chapter 3 verse 10 every tree that does not produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire so it is not enough to say abraham is my father or you no know, or god is my father uh, it has to show in your actions you must if you are if you are a descendant of abraham then you must your actions must be the same as those of abraham you know who submitted to the lord even to the extent of being willing to sacrifice his own son so and if you say that god is your father then your actions should be such that you are becoming more and more like jesus christ his son so i mean um, uh, this is proof that your repentance is genuine which is why uh, paul also says the same thing uh, acts chapter 26 verse 20 if someone could read out acts 26 verse 20 Uh, can I get the reference again? Acts chapter six. Ah, uh, Acts twenty six. Ah, uh, twenty. Okay. Okay. Acts chapter twenty six, verse twenty. First to those in Damascus, then to those in Jerusalem, and in all Judea, and to the Gentiles also. I preached that they should repent and turn to God, and prove their repentance by their deeds. Prove their repentance by their deeds. So if the repentance is genuine, there will be deeds, uh, and it says in the NIV, demonstrate their repentance by their deeds. So um, if the repentance is true, it will automatically show up in the uh, in the changed actions, you know, um, that we are now having in our lives. And uh, I think it was last class that we you know looked upon um, this passage, Matthew chapter five, verses twenty nine and thirty, where it says, you know, if your right eye causes you to stumble, gouge it out and throw it away um and it goes on to talk about you know cutting off your right hand and all of that um because it says it is better for you to lose one part of your body than for your whole body to go into hell is what um we saw and we also saw the fact that uh, this is uh, metaphoric language nothing is to be gained by actually physically cutting off a hand or gouging out an eye Uh, because the attitude of sin which is there inside will continue right so over here it's metaphorically speaking um uh, so uh, jesus is saying if something is getting in the way you know get rid of it uh, so uh, we talked about how we would have to chop off 
all the triggers that lead us into temptation so if it is uh, your the people with whom you are you know mingling and moving around with if they are the ones leading you into sin you would have to cut off that relationship with them uh, you know you can no longer be friends with them uh, if it is uh, uh, an internet uh, you know channel that is you know some some uh, some entertainment channel that is causing you to sin then you would have to you know cancel off your subscription to that so whatever it is that is kind of leading you towards sin that has to be gouged out that has to be cut off uh, so uh, just simply cutting off literal body parts is not going to change anything because that attitude of sin which is inside the heart and the mind uh, you know inside the unrenewed mind that would continue so uh, over here it is metaphoric language uh, where it is saying whatever is causing you to sin it's time to get rid of it and sometimes it is very difficult uh, to you know um, to get rid of those things uh, because the person might have been you know uh, holding on to those things his entire lifetime and so now to suddenly change you know if uh, the it's like uh, almost if the person gives up that then it's like they have nothing left because they have been so dependent on that thing you know um, uh, they're kind of addicted to that sin and if they just give it up it's like as if they're left with a vacuum and it's like they have nothing now left in their hands so it's like almost as bad as that so uh when it comes to you know cutting off the things which are leading us into sin um we may sometimes need uh the help of others so when we cannot handle this this you know living in holiness on our own when we cannot um get rid of those things which are dragging us down when we cannot do it on our own uh, the wise thing the godly thing which we are taught in scripture is that we must reach out to other mature believers who can help us in our walk um, and uh, not particularly sure whether we looked at this um, passage or not in our you know holiness sessions uh, Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 if someone could just you know turn in your Bible to that and um, and you can actually tell me whether we touched upon that or not because there's no point in my repeating myself it's just that I teach multiple courses and I have sometimes forget what I have taught where uh, so Galatians chapter 6 verses 1 to 2 have we looked at that you know about carrying each other's burdens is that something which i talked about in our holiness series wow is anyone even attending the class yeah uh, i think we once talked about it Okay, so so carrying each other's burdens and how that word over there burden uh, what it signifies uh, because and then later on in um, I think in Galatians 4 it says you know you need to carry your own burden and we kind of looked at the contrast between carrying each other's burdens and carrying our own burden so did we kind of talk about that you know the, the meaning of that word burden and what it actually means that did we cover Oh, well okay I'll um, you know just go ahead and touch upon that um, because um, it would kind of help if we know that what it really makes me wonder is anyone there behind those uh, you know those little tiles which with, with the names on them is anyone <laughs> even there in the class uh, we've looked at Galatians chapter 5 once 32 to 24 we looked into that Okay. And according to my notes, I wrote Galatians chapter six, but I didn't write the verse, so I'm not very sure. Uh, well, okay. Um, yeah. So, um, yeah, Galatians chapter six, uh, you know, verses one and two. It says how we have a responsibility towards one another because uh, this walking in holiness, uh, this having to you know make sacrifices, uh, all of this is not easy. Easy to talk about. But when it comes to actually chopping off those things which are holding us down, not something that we can do on our own. And so, uh, you know, it it urges us over here in the scriptures to help each other in doing that. 
So verse 2, Galatians chapter 6, verse 2, very specifically says that it says, carry each other's burdens. And over here, that word burden, uh, it's a Greek word, baros. Okay, It talks about uh, a, a load which is so heavy that you cannot carry it on your own. So it's not talking about some ordinary burden. It's saying carry each other's burdens. Why? Because those burdens cannot be carried by that person on their own. You need help in in you know in 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 doing that. Um, so that word barrows. Uh, this is basically the meaning of that word. You know, uh, if if someone could read out Second Corinthians chapter one verse eight. Second Corinthians chapter one verse eight. Second Corinthians chapter one verse eight. We do not want you to be uniformed, brothers, about the hardships we suffered in the province of Asia. We were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure, so that we despaired even of life. It here, it's uh, you know, uh, Paul is talking about uh, the experiences that they had gone through, and he says uh, we were under great pressure, far beyond our ability to endure. So over there, when it's talking about the great pressure that they were under, you know, this kind of pressure that they were unable to endure on their own, uh, that word used over there is barrows. So here in Galatians chapter 6, that's the word being used. And, uh, you know, Paul says to the believers, you got to help each other carry this kind of barrows, this kind of burden. Uh, so when it comes to walking in holiness, it would really help you know, if uh, we can have one or two other persons uh, who can uh, walk alongside us. We, can, we can't open up to everyone about what we are going through in our spiritual life, but people whom we can trust, you know, someone who's mature, if we can have one or two persons uh, that we can reach out to and who can, you know, support us, strengthen us, uh, that would make a great difference. So it says that we should help each other in carrying our burdens. So if we are unable to overcome some sin on our own, then we reach out uh, to a fellow believer and we, you know, say, you know, if you can pray along with me, you know, if you can um, uh, just, you know, encourage me when I'm feeling down. Uh, so that way we can, you know, encourage each other to walk in the Lord and maintain our uh, holiness. So um, a holy walk is not something that we do on our own. Okay, so it is something that we would need uh, the, the Lord's, um, you know, we, we would need the Lord's help and uh, the help of the Lord's people in, you know, in, in having this walk. But uh, God from his side, he also puts in that uh, willingness and that desire uh, for us to act in holiness. Uh, and uh, so maybe we can look at it, Philippians chapter 2 verses 12 to 13 where it talks about how God, in fact, helps us, uh, you know, in, in, in our uh, having a holy life. Uh, someone could read out Philippians 2, 12 to 13. Philippians 2, chapter, uh, chapter 2, verse 12 to 13. Therefore, my beloved, as you have always obeyed, not as in my presence only, but now much more in my absence, Work out your salvation with fear and trembling, for it is God who works in you both to will and to do his good pleasure. So it is the Lord who gives us that will, that desire uh, to live in a godly way. Okay, So it's not like we have been left on our own. God puts in us this desire and this will uh, to act. He is the one who you know, initiates that hunger in us for holiness. He's the one who makes us want to, uh, you know, uh, pursue this, even though it is difficult. So we have the Lord's help. We also have the help of uh, fellow believers. So this is not something that we are being asked to do on our own. And also um, another thing which kind of motivates us to walk in holiness is the fact that, you know, God says that he will um, bless us when we do that. You know, So we also have this reward that we can look forward to. Um, maybe someone could read out Deuteronomy chapter 30, verses 1 to 3. Uh, Deuteronomy 30, 1 to 3. So 
Deuteronomy chapter 30 verses 1 to 3. When all these blessings and curses I have set before you comes upon you and you take them to heart wherever the Lord your God disperses you among the nations. And when you and your children return to the Lord your God and obey him with all your heart and with all your soul, according to everything I command you today, then the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you and gather you again from all the nations where he scattered you. Uh, here it says, uh, you know, if you take, uh, okay, in, in Deuteronomy 30 verse 1, it says, uh, if you take them to heart, wherever the Lord your God has dispersed you. So what God is saying, the word of correction that he is offering, uh, if the Lord says, if you take that to heart and if you act upon it, uh, and you know, in verse 2, it says, if you return to the Lord your God and obey him, if you do that, verse 3 says, the Lord your God will restore your fortunes and have compassion on you. So we have this assurance that times of refreshing will come from the Lord. Uh, we are given this promise that his light will begin to flood our lives, every area of our lives, where earlier we only felt hopelessness and darkness. Now, you know, his light will begin to flood even those areas of life where we, we, where we think that nothing will change, where, you know, God will uh, never help. Why? Because now we have chosen to take to heart what he has said. And we are now actually actively trying to apply those things in our lives. So uh, we have the support of God himself who gives us that desire, that will to, uh, to live according to his will. We have the support of fellow believers uh, who stand with us and help us to overcome uh, sin. Uh, we also have this uh, assurance of the reward which is awaiting us. Of course, there's an eternal reward in heaven. But here, even while we are here on this earth, God promises that he will restore our fortunes. Even as we begin to walk in holiness, we will also experience the blessings of his presence. Uh, we will, Because now, uh, because holiness leads to a greater presence of God in our lives, uh, it will also automatically draw in more of his light. You know, um, areas of darkness where uh, things were not working out, those areas are now flooded with his light and uh, the you know, evil forces can no longer um, you know, harm us, oppress us in those areas. So we will in fact begin to see even blessings to a greater level uh, when we walk in holiness. So all of this should kind of you know, encourage us and um, make us believe that this is not uh, something hopeless. What we are doing is something which actually will bear a lot of good fruit. So, you know, so we, we should have this active hope in us. Uh, now, um, uh, in one of your chapters, I think, yeah, it is chapter four, you know, chapter four of this repentance section, it kind of gives you a brief summary about um, uh, what Romans talks about. Because in Romans, uh, the main emphasis of Paul was that, you know, now you guys have become believers. So you can't continue living the way you used to before. Um, that was an old attitude that's gone away with the old life. Now you have been made new. So now you cannot um, continue the way you were earlier. So very briefly uh, in, you know, in chapter four, there's a kind of summary given about uh, what the different chapters of Romans are talking about. So maybe we could just very, um, you know, um, shortly look at that. Um, Romans chapter 5, okay? It basically starts off in Romans chapter 5, where uh, he explains that, you know, we have now been made free. We have been justified. We have received an abundance of God's grace. All those things, all the beautiful things that we have now received from God, those things are talked about in Romans chapter 5. Uh, maybe we can actually just read out uh, Romans chapter 5, verses 1 and 2. If someone could read out Romans 5, 1 and 2. Romans chapter 5, verse 1 and 2. Therefore, since we have been justified through faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have gained access by faith into his grace, in which we now stand, and we rejoice in the hope of the glory of God. Okay, so 
a lot of good things have been done for us. We have been justified through faith. We now have peace with God. God is no longer angry with us. He no longer wants to judge us. We now have his grace, which is available to us. You know, it's a grace which enables us to walk uh, in a different way. And we have this future hope of, you know, uh, glory, you know, which is awaiting us, the hope of the glory of God. So we have all of these good things. And so because we have all of these good things, um, you know, we cannot continue in sin just because grace is there. We can't say, you know, oh, I now that grace is available to me in abundance and I have all of these things. I even have hope of a future glory because all of these things are awaiting me. I cannot just simply say I will continue in sin. So Romans 6 talks about that. It talks about how because grace is now available to you, don't say I will continue to sin. Rather, you should have to, you should take a stand and say no that you will honor God. So Romans chapter six, uh, verses one and two. If someone could read out Romans six one and two. Romans chapter six, verse one and two. What shall we say then? Shall we go on sinning so that grace may increase? By no means. We died to sin. How can we live in it any longer? Okay, so. Uh, in uh, Romans 5, after talking about all the privilege that, privileges that we have in Christ, Romans 6 says, don't take these privileges for granted. Rather, you know, uh, guard yourselves and take a stand against sin. Why? Because we have died to sin. And if we have died to sin, how can we live it in, 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 in it any longer? We've already looked at that, right? Romans chapter 6, verses 6 to 7, where it talks about how the old self has already been crucified with Christ. So we are now a new creation. So we no longer need to live in sin. Uh, so Romans 6 emphasizes that. And then Romans 7 goes on to talk about how unregenerated people live. You know, we are the regenerated ones. The Holy Spirit regenerated us. He uh, made us into a new creation. So we have been birthed as a new person by him. But the old, uh, you know, the, 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 the people who are still living unregenerated lives, they live in sin. So that is when in Romans chapter 7, uh, Paul talks about how he wants to follow God, but he's unable to follow God. And so he talks about his past life. Uh, that would be Romans chapter 7, verse 14 to 20. He says, um, I am unspiritual, sold as a slave to sin. He says in Romans 7, 14 and in uh, Romans 7, 15, he goes on to say, for what I want to do, I do not do. But what I hate, I do. And then uh, 17, he says, it is no longer I myself who do it, but it is sin living in me. So he says, you know, sin is controlling me. It's not allowing me to do what I actually want to do. Um, then verse 18, he says, uh, I have the desire to do what is good, but I cannot carry it out. And then uh, verse 19, he says, I do not do the good I want to do, but the evil I do not want to do. This I keep on doing. So all of these things he talks about. And he says, you know what? We are not like that anymore. So we are Romans 5. Romans 5, which says that we have been set free. We have been justified. Romans 6, which says that now the old self is gone. We are now a new creation who have the power and the freedom to live a holy life. So we cannot use the excuses which the unregenerated people will use. So Romans 7 does not apply to us. We cannot use Romans 7 and say, oh, I want to do good, but I'm unable to do. We cannot use that excuse. Why? Because of Romans 5 and Romans 6. And so he says in Romans 8, we have to make a conscious choice to walk in the spirit. Uh, we have to make a conscious choice to end the sinful deeds that we are, uh, you know, still entertaining. So Romans chapter 8, verses 12 to 13. If someone could read out Romans 8, 12 to 13. Romans chapter 8, verse 12 to 13. Therefore, brothers, we have an obligation, but it is not to the sinful nature to live according to it. But if you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the spirit you put to death the mistakes of the body, you will live. So he says, we cannot use the excuse which Rom uh, the, you know, the Romans chapter 7 unregenerated people use. They are helpless. They are under the control of sin. But what about us? We are Romans 6. We are a new creation. 
we are Romans 5. We have been set free. We have been justified. We have been given abundant grace. So we are Romans 6 and uh, Ro Romans chapter 5 and Romans 6. So we can't pretend that we are helpless like the Romans 7 people. So he says in Romans 8, you have an obligation because of who you have been made into by God. You now have an obligation. You have an obligation to live according to the spirit and put to death the misdeeds of the body. So he says we would have to take an active step where we, we say no to the flesh and we say yes to the spirit. It's something that we, we are obligated to do now. And so then in Romans chapter 12, he says, um, how do you do this? You do this by constantly renewing your mind. If your mind goes on thinking the old thought patterns, if it goes on, you know, seeing, thinking that sin is OK, that sin is all right, then uh, no change will ever take place. So on a daily basis, we would have to actively renew our mind and teach it to follow the Lord, uh, teach it to follow the ways of the Lord. And so uh, Romans chapter 12, verse 2, which we are very familiar with, it says, you know, be transformed by the renewing of your mind. OK, so um, the focus of Romans, one of, one of the main points of focus in Romans is how now that we have been made new in Christ, we now have an obligation to the spirit to follow him. We no longer have an obligation to the flesh to follow its desires. So this is, you know, repentance where we actually choose to follow the spirit rather than follow our own fleshly desires. So um, um, uh, so you could say that the teaching on repentance is kind of you know, summed up in the book of Romans. Uh, now coming to um, another aspect, maybe if someone could read out Titus chapter 2, verses 11 to 14. Titus 2, 11 to 14. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 to 14. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and worldly passions and to live self controlled, upright, and godly lives in the present age while we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior Jesus Christ, who gave himself for us to redeem us from all wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own eager to do what what is good okay so uh, here in the letter uh, to uh, titus this is what you know uh, he says he says why did jesus christ redeem us it says in verse 14 titus 2 verse 14 he redeemed us from all wickedness why so that to purify for himself a people who will be eager to do what is good okay so the whole point in in God redeeming us is so that we will become eager to do what is good. And that is why it says in 1 John chapter 1, verse 6 to 7, you know, if we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in the darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. So the whole reason why we were redeemed is so that we will become a pure people who are eager to do what is good. So Instead of being eager to do what is good, you know, if we are continuing to walk in the darkness, then we don't really have fellowship with Jesus Christ. Uh, uh, so um, if someone could read out 1 John chapter 1, verses, um, verses 6 to 10. Yeah, I think yeah, it's good if we can read the entire section. 1 John chapter 1, uh, verses 6 to 10. First John chapter 1 verses 6 to 10. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus Christ, his son, cleanses us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. If we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. 
If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Okay, so over here, first in First John chapter one verses uh, six to ten, it's talking about two kinds of lies, uh, which these uh, people were speaking. Um, the letter, the first letter which John wrote to the believers, um, he's basically trying to address some false teachings which have come into the church. All right, so at that point of time. Um, there was this teaching going around that once uh, Jesus Christ has, you know, washed your sins and clothed you with his righteousness, you are no longer capable of making any sin. So you can do what you want, uh, but it is not sin. Why? Because, you know, God has sanctified you. So anything that you do is no longer a sin. So they had this kind of wrong idea. And so because they were thinking that now, you know, we have been sanctified, they were becoming kind of slack in their spiritual walk. They were entertaining um, compromises, you know, and no longer keeping themselves truly holy. And uh, so the first lie which John points out is, you know, you people are saying that you're having fellowship with Jesus, but look at your lifestyle. You're walking in the darkness. So lie number one, the first lie is that, you're actually not in fellowship with Jesus. You think that you're in fellowship with, with Jesus, but when you look at your lifestyle, it's actually you're walk, walking in darkness. And this is second lie. The second lie is that um, you are pretending that you know uh, you have no sin. So even though you are doing things which are questionable, you are pretending and saying that no, this is not sin because you know I am a sanctified believer. So uh, John clarifies and he says, um, people who are living in habitual sin on a daily basis, daily consciously going against what God wants, and they are habitually living in sin, such people, they should not even bother claiming that they have fellowship with Christ because they don't. On the other hand, all believers will fall into sin sometime or the other. You know, because we have not yet become completely renewed in our mind. And we are also still stuck inside this human body, uh, which has all these uh, fleshly desires. You know, so um, because of these reasons, we have not yet become completely perfect. So uh, even believers will sin once in a while. And when we do that, rather than pretending and saying to ourselves, no, no, this is not sin because I am a sanctified believer, it's better to openly confess to the Lord and say, yes, what I have done is wrong, O Lord. And, you know, we ask him for his forgiveness. And when we do that, it says in uh, 1 John 1, 9, he purifies us from all unrighteousness. Okay, so uh, on the other hand, you know, in, in, say, he says in verse 10, on the other hand, if you're claiming and saying, no, 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 we have not sinned, then you're saying that God is a liar. God is saying that you have committed a wrong, that you have committed a sin. And so it is better for you to admit that you have sinned. So um, so over here, um, repentance is two things. First of all, we look at our life, our everyday life, and we ask ourselves, am I habitually you know, living in sin? There may be some three or four things you know, that we are kind of uh, unable to overcome. And we are every day living in that sinful lifestyle. If that is the case, then we should stop pretending that we have fellowship with Jesus. We should instead, you know, become very alert and, uh, you know, understand the danger that we are in. And we must consciously uh, work towards, you know, getting back um, uh, into actual fellowship with the Lord. So that is the first thing. The second thing it says over here is that, um, there are times when we will fail the Lord. There are times when we will go into sin. When we do that, rather than pretending that what we have done is not sin, we must openly admit that we have committed a sinful deed. And then the Lord himself will forgive us and he will purify us from that unrighteous act. And he will also, in fact, purify us from the unrighteousness which is there you know, in our life, in our mind. Uh, so he will begin to cleanse us because we have honestly gone to him and admitted our weakness. So repentance is not hiding from God and pretending that everything is okay. Rather, repentance is openly going to him and saying, yes, what I have done is wrong, 
but lord now you purify me from unrighteousness you help me to live right and then the, the lord you know empowers us to do that uh, um just to you know look at another passage in this context um john chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 if someone could read out john chapter 3 verses 20 and 21 John chapter three verse twenty and twenty one. Everyone who does evil hates the light and will not come into the light for fear that his deeds will be exposed. But whoever lives by the truth comes into the light, so that it may be seen plainly that what he has done has been done through God. Okay, so people of darkness, uh, people who are uh, you know not yet a part of God's family, they avoid the light. because if they know they know that if they come into the light you know into the full light of uh, the holiness of god then all the things you know which they are pretending are good and nice are not really nice because everyone will be able to see the ugliness of what they are doing because now they are standing in the light of god's holiness so uh, ungodly people will try to hide from the light but it says people who are believers people who are the people of god they should be willing to come and you know be there in the light they should not be people who hide and say oh no 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 what i'm doing is not really sinful ah you know i'm actually a sanctified believer so i'm incapable of sin those would all be very silly things to say you know rather it is good for us to come directly into the light and say yes lord i admit that what i have done is wrong you know um, because <laughs> when we try to hide us uh, hide the truth uh, that gives satan a foothold um so rather than trying to hide in the darkness even when we have done wrong we choose to come into the light and say yes lord i stand over here exposed and lord i repent and now lord you purify me from unrighteousness so rather than hiding from god it is better to come openly before him and admit our weakness admit our sinfulness and when we do that he purifies us from unrighteousness and you know he strengthens us um yeah uh, so uh, just another maybe another one verse before we move on to the next thought first uh, john chapter 3 verse 4 if someone could read out first john chapter 3 verse 4 first john chapter 3 verse 4 we shall be like him Okay. Mm-hmm. First John chapter three verse four. Everyone who sins breaks the law. In fact, mm-hmm. sin is lawlessness. Okay, so everyone who sins breaks the law. So even a believer who has done a sinful deed that is considered as lawlessness. So um, uh, you know, uh, there's no such thing as a holy sin. Okay, that was the wrong, you know, uh, teaching that was going on at that time. you know in the time of john when he was forced to write that letter to correct them uh, so at that time they were saying you know oh we now we are a holy people so even if we sin you know it gets covered by the holiness of god so there is no such thing as a holy sin uh, sin is lawlessness it is a breaking of the law it's a breaking of god's commandments so um, whether uh, even if you are a believer if you have committed a sin you can't just say that you know god will just cover it up it is an act of lawlessness it's an act of rebellion against god so you would have to repent and come back to god and say yes what i did is was in rebellion against you but now you know i am repenting of my rebelliousness and i'm coming back to you and i am willing to submit myself to you okay so um there is no such thing as a holy sin sin is sin and uh, so we too have to uh, you know confess our sins whenever we do anything that is uh, wrong um maybe we can also look at first corinthians chapter 1 verse 30 if someone could read out first corinthians 1 verse 30 first corinthians 1 verse 30 First Corinthians chapter one verse thirteen. Mm-hmm. Is no, Christ no, no, divided? No, no, no. A thirty, thirty, three zero. Sorry, yeah, my pronunciation. First Corinthians one three zero thirty. 
130 but of him you are in Christ Jesus who became for us wisdom from God and unrighteousness and sanctification and redemption uh it says that Jesus Christ is our righteousness he is our holiness he is our redemption so because he is these things uh, we choose to stay in him we choose to abide in him so rather than pretending that what we are doing is not sinful you know we admit that we have you know the the branch has kind of become uh, disconnected from the vine so we admit and say lord what i have done it has kind of weakened my connection you know with the vine and so we we choose to go back to him and when we repent it's like you know we are um, we are reattaching ourselves firmly you know into the vine and when we do that uh, his righteousness his holiness and his redemption you know it it flows into our lives and that is why it says in first corinthians chapter 5 verses 11 to 13 those who are not doing this abiding you know those who are continuing to um uh enjoy their habitual sins such people we must not even associate with them that's what it says over there in first corinthians 5 11 to 13 it says you must not associate with anyone who claims to be a brother or sister but is sexually immoral or greedy or an idolat idolater or a slanderer and all of this long list of things do not even eat with such people okay so you're not you're not supposed to have any social fellowship with such people and then it goes on to say in verse 13 expel the wicked person from among you so that should be our stand we are people who make a conscious choice to abide in the vine to have to maintain a strong connection with the vine and if we have people like this among us who are tempting us to you know become more um, more compromising in our standards uh, people who are kind of you know encouraging us to take uh, holiness in a light manner then we would have to take a very strict stand and in fact expel such people from our community so that they don't contaminate uh, our standards so we maintain we continue to maintain the high standards that god requires of us um, in fact the same thing is applied even to the leaders um, you know first timothy chapter 5 verses 19 to 22 uh, it talks so it's talk, talking very specifically about the leaders of the church over here and it says but those you know uh, first timothy chapter 5 verse 20 it says those elders who are sinning you are to reprove before everyone so that the others may take warning so when a leader uh, is living in habitual sin in front of everyone he must be publicly uh, corrected why so that uh, the rest of the congregation which is looking up to this leader will realize the truth and you know they will see how is this person going to respond now will he humbly repent and change you know or or is he going to arrogantly try to uh, you know um, support the sinful thing that he is doing so uh, leaders uh, are have to be publicly corrected uh, when they are living in habitual sin and are, and are refused to, refusing to give up certain things and then uh, in first timothy 5 verse 21 it goes on to say you know keep these instructions without partiality and to do nothing out of favoritism so just because they are leaders you know don't give them special treatment uh, just the way you would throw out you know the, the same way you would expel a believer who is doing a wrong thing you know and holding on to the wrong teaching and spreading it you must treat the leaders also in the same way you must be willing to uh take serious action against them and so over here you know paul says um don't show partiality don't show favoritism even if they are leaders you must take action against them so this is the serious stand you know which uh, the church is called upon to take regarding holiness because in god's eyes um you know all sins are uh, equally evil um you know um we are kind of um out of time uh, but you know just to, for me to touch upon revelation chapter 21 verse 8 you know it talks about all the terrible people who did not make it to heaven 
it talks about murderers it talks about the sexually immoral it talks about people who have you know indulged in witchcraft and literally associated with the uh, evil spirits it talks about all of those people but it also talks about liars so in god's eyes doesn't matter whether you know you are involved in murder and uh, adultery or whether you're just a person who you know who's a habitual liar the point is sin is sin and sin leads to only one single destination whether you have you know managed to go to hell by committing murder or whether you have you know managed to go to hell because you know you are uh, you enjoy living in a, a lie and you know you you are not willing to give up that habitual lying it's equally serious so sin is sin and uh, so um, the whole point of today's session is not to take uh, not to be comfortable at our level but to reach out and make his thoughts our thoughts to uh, to reach his level of living let his ways be our ways okay so uh, we really are out of time so let's just close with a word of prayer lord we just thank you so much for today's uh, session thank you a lot for reminding us once again that you are uh, thinking of action it's not enough for us to talk about holiness it's not enough for us to just pray and say oh lord make us holy it is also time for us so oh lord to actually act uh, to examine ourselves and see what is lacking and if we are lacking uh, our thoughts are not in line with yours oh lord uh, help us to bring them in alignment with your thoughts if our actions our ways are not your ways then i pray oh lord that you would uh, give us that strength that we need to align ourselves with your ways we pray oh lord that you would help each one of us to do this um, by the power of your holy spirit uh, through your strengthening we pray oh lord that we would actually take action this week uh, to to um, to repair and mend and repent of those things a lot uh, that need to be taken care of you help us a lot to do that thank you lord in jesus name amen amen thank you so much for those of you who have stuck out to up to the end uh yeah we'll meet again next week thank you